Hi, I'm Jamie Knapp. You know, a lot of times in the church, we talk about the first vision over and over and over again. And yet there are things about that first vision that we don't really talk about. And those are the exact things that it's super important that your team knows. And I think you're going to find that you're glad you know them too. So let's jump right in today to what your team needs to know about the first vision. Now, we all know the Joseph Smith story, but what we don't know is that Joseph actually went through some very real struggles. In fact, in some of the accounts, it says suddenly an unseen power seized him. He tried to speak again, but his tongue was still bound. A thick darkness closed in around him until he could no longer see the sunlight. Doubts and awful images flashed across his mind, confusing and distracting him. Now, why don't we talk about this? I don't know. Maybe it's because we have this perception that if someone is a prophet, they must be perfect, right? They must not have any negative thoughts or any problems. Well, the truth of the matter is that is simply not true. Joseph Smith was very much a man, and I think it's helpful for our teens to know that. I remember as a teen reading the Joseph Smith vision and thinking, okay, well, I'm going to try that, right? Maybe if I have enough faith and kneel down, I, I know that I'm not going to see Heavenly Father, but maybe I'll see an angel. And you know what? It never happened. And I had this belief as a teenager that I must just not have enough faith. I think it's important for every teenager to recognize that the fact that they haven't seen a heavenly messenger does not mean they're broken. The fact that they have doubts about themselves. Am I good enough? Am I spiritual enough? Do I even have a testimony? The fact that they have thoughts about things that they maybe shouldn't have thoughts about does not make them bad people. And we're going to talk about why so that they can understand why those thoughts come and why it doesn't mean they're broken. So let's jump right into that. Joseph had these thoughts that made him feel confused and distracted. And as we're going to learn, that's actually one of Satan's biggest tools. He wants to make every single one of us feel confused and distracted because he doesn't have to make us do something awful. He just has to distract us from doing what is good, what we need to do. And that's exactly what he did to Joseph that day in the grove. Now, it goes on to say he found himself sinking into despair, overwhelmed by the unbearable darkness and ready to abandon himself to destruction. Is there any one of us who has not felt that? Who has not felt overwhelmed? Who has not felt despair as they go to do exactly what they feel is right? Now, there are evidences time and time again in the scriptures Moses experienced it after he saw the burning bush. It is a very common pattern in scripture that when we are moving forward in the right direction, we will feel some sense of overwhelm, some, some sense of despair of I'm not good enough. There's no way I can do this. It's completely normal, completely normal. And even Joseph Smith felt it that day. So if your teen is feeling some of that overwhelm, if you are feeling the overwhelm, it means nothing about the goodness of your soul or the path or direction you're on, except for maybe an indication that there's a good chance you're on the right path and you're doing some good things and someone doesn't exactly want you to get there. In the grove, it says, at that moment, a pillar of light appeared over his head. It descended slowly and seemed to set the woods on fire. Kind of like Moses, right? As the light rested on him, Joseph felt the unseen power release its hold. The spirit of God took its place filling him with peace and unspeakable joy. That's the accounts from saints. Now I want you to notice that it says, as the light descended slowly and rested upon him, he felt the unseen power release its hold. Now that gives some indication that when we are feeling those feelings of doubt, of confusion, of overwhelm, what we need is for the light of God to rest upon us, correct? But how do we get there? Let's talk a little bit about that. First, it's super important that we understand what happened first when God the Father and Jesus Christ spoke to Joseph. A lot of times and in a lot of the accounts, what we talk about is, oh, you should join none of the churches. I'm going to reveal the truth. And that is all true. But please understand what was said first. And that was, Joseph, thy sins are forgiven. 
What we sometimes don't talk about is that one of the primary reasons Joseph went to the grove to pray that day is he was concerned about the welfare of his soul. He felt like he wasn't worthy and he wanted to go and know his standing before God. One of his primary concerns was, I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. And so the first thing that heaven told him is, Joseph, thy sins are forgiven. Now, why does that matter to us? Once again, as a kid, I thought, well, maybe it was because he's a prophet. It wasn't because he was a prophet. One thing that your teen has to understand is that the Savior doesn't wait until we are whole and walking in the light to come to us. Instead, he brings light into the darkness to heal us. That day, was Joseph perfect? No but he wanted to come to the Lord. And as he did, the Lord came to him. It wasn't Joseph that dispelled the darkness. It was God. It was the savior. And as they came into Joseph's darkness, into the darkness that had surrounded him, into his doubts and his confusion, they dispelled the darkness. They said, Joseph, your sins are forgiven. They called him by name. They let him know he was loved. And that, my friend, is how heaven works. God does not wait until we are perfect to come to us. And he will not expect your team to be perfect or whole before they can feel his love, before they can feel his direction. Joseph was not perfect. And yet he received some very profound and real revelation that day. And Joseph, as a 14-year-old boy, was not all that different from your child. In Saints, it says his guilt and confusion were gone. Feelings of divine love filled his heart. As that light came, it wasn't so much that Joseph changed as that he was able to feel the love of God. And that love gave him hope. It gave him hope. It gave him clarity. What we need to know is that sometimes we feel that because we have doubt, because we have confusion, because we might not be good enough, we feel like we're in this cloud. It can look like discouragement, despair, overwhelm, or just I'm not good enough. Sometimes we think that there's a barrier between us and the love of God. The reason I don't feel the spirit more is because of where I am. The reason I don't have more blessings in my life is because of where I am. But my friend, that is simply one of the lies that Satan tells us. The truth is, is that if we go to the Savior seeking his love, that his love will dispel the darkness. We don't have to be whole first. We don't have to be perfect. It is the act of going to him and saying, I want to be healed. I want knowledge. I want truth that makes us worthy of that. We don't have to be perfect. His love helps us get there. There's evidence of this also in the story of the woman who was committed, who was caught in the act of adultery. The savior did not say, hey, I need you to repent first and then I can heal you. No, he said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And he called himself the light of the world. Did he know that she was in darkness? Absolutely. Absolutely. Did he care? Yes, but not because he condemned her, because he knew that she needed his love. And that's exactly what he gave her that day and exactly what he gave Joseph and what he gives each of us when we come to him. In Joseph Smith history, it says, in consequence of these things, I often felt condemned for my weakness and perfection. When on the evening of the above mentioned 21st of September, and after I had retired to my bed for the night, I betook myself to prayer and supplication to Almighty God for forgiveness of all my sins and follies, and also for a manifestation to me that I might know of my state and standing before him. One thing we forget is that when Joseph went and prayed in his bedroom before Moroni came to him and told him about the plates, the reason he was praying is because he once again was unsure of his standing before God. Let me remind you, he had already seen God at the Father and Jesus Christ. 
he had already had this divine manifestation. And yet three years later, he said to himself, I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know where I stand before God. My friends, even a prophet of God wondered if he was good enough. And that is his primary purpose in going before the Lord when he prays that night. It wasn't just to find out what else should I do. It was to find out it's been three years. I haven't really, I don't, what's going on, right? I'm not receiving maybe the answers I thought I would receive is something wrong. That's why he went to the Lord. And yet once again, Moroni says to him that God had forgiven him of his sins and now had a work for him to do. Heaven knows that this is something that every single one of us struggles with. We wonder if we're okay. We are very aware of our sins and we worry. And yet the first thing that the messenger from heaven said to Joseph is, your sins are forgiven. Now let's go to work, right? I have a work for you. I know you. And there are things that you can do even when you feel broken. Even when you feel broken. Now, Joseph, beware, he said. When you go to get the plates, your mind will be filled with darkness and all manner of evil will rush into your mind to prevent you from keeping the commandments of God. Now, why would the angel of the Lord tell him this? Is it because Joseph was a bad person? No, it was because Moroni knows how the opposition works. Moroni knew that Joseph's mission was important and that as soon as he took steps toward it, that the opposition would send negative thoughts into his mind. So if you're having negative thoughts, if you're having, you know, discouragement or doubts or even thinking about things you maybe shouldn't, don't assume that it is because you're broken or because you're doing something wrong. Recognize that those thoughts being sent to us are part of how things work, right? That's how the opposition works and always has, even with a prophet. So instead of beating yourself up about having those thoughts, instead recognize and expect that they will come and be prepared as Joseph was to combat those. No, hey, when these thoughts show up, I know it's the opposition. And instead of wondering about myself, I'm going to recognize them for what they are and push them out. I'm going to get rid of them and I'm going to keep going. The angel Moroni said um, to Joseph, in Joseph Smith History 1, it says, he told me that I should come to the place precisely. This is when he had tried to get the plates and had been forbidden. He told me I should come to that place precisely in one year from that time, that he would there meet with me and that I should continue to do so until the time should come for obtaining the plates. Skipping ahead, I went, to the I went at the end of each year and at each time I found the same messenger there and reviewed instruction and intelligence from him at each of our interviews. Was Joseph perfect when he started? No. But did the Lord teach him and guide him along the way as he moved forward in imperfection? Absolutely. Sometimes what qualifies us for the Lord's work is not that we're perfect, but that we're willing to come to God. We're willing to be taught and we're willing to accept his love. So as your teen recognizes that God does not expect any of us to be perfect, that he comes to us in the darkness and that if we will listen, he will guide us step by step to get us where we need to be, to help us hear his word and to meet us where we are, because he loves us exactly where we are. I'm Jamie Knapp. Thank you for joining me as we learn the important lessons of the first vision.